Good evening. I uh, debated for a while where I'm supposed to stand on Sunday nights because it's been a while. Um, I'm going to be up here. I think it might help you guys who are up in the balcony masked up, uh, so I'll be up here. Uh, my other thought was I wanted to be up here so I could see my wife's expression with some of what I will say tonight, and then I realized I can't because she's wearing a mask. So I'm kind of stuck there. I preached this morning, if you weren't here um, or if you weren't watching online, about the fig tree that Jesus curses and about what was going on in the temple when he clears the temple and how all of that is related to the things going on on the outside are very different than what's going on on the inside. And now tonight I'm preaching about family and I'm a little concerned uh, because I look at some of these things that uh, I want to encourage us all to do and I think are very scriptural ideas and I realize just how far short I fall on some of this. Uh, and so maybe the distance between me and you will help when the lightning strikes too, I don't know. Uh, but I think there'll be some things here to encourage us along. And I, I want us to remind us of a couple things uh, when we start. Uh, I know there are, there are topics that I feel like we need to talk about in church life that at the same time don't necessarily apply to everybody in the same way. And so it's easy to tune those things out. You, you know, if you come here and uh, you are single uh, or you are divorced and you think to yourself, I don't want to hear a lesson about marriage because that doesn't really apply to me. I hope there are enough truths within, within that for all Christians that we can still pick some things out here and there. Uh, with family, that's kind of an easy thing for us to do with too, because uh, if you are living at home by yourself, uh, if you don't have a lot of family around and nearby, then it's easy for you to just kind of by nature tune some of this out. But I will remind you of a couple things. Uh, one, God's family that we just sang about, uh, great song choice by the way. Uh, there's a lot of what we'll learn about as family that will deal with us as church family too, and I think we can apply a lot of it in that way. Uh, secondly, there are other people just like you here if you don't have family that is here. And because of that, you kind of by nature become family to someone else and maybe they become family to you. Uh, I grew up with a single mom uh, at church and I didn't have a dad at home. And so there were a lot of men there at the church that would kind of fill in that role for me and what they did. So uh, don't assume that you're not family to somebody as we look into all this. Uh, so I say all that to say, uh, don't tune me out yet, and hopefully we'll find some things in here that we can all see that are worthwhile together. I think I have both switches the right way, and it's not clicking. They might have tried to put a safety on to make sure I wouldn't do anything bad today. If you weren't here this morning, I was clicking the slides all over the place for the first two songs. All right, uh, family. Family becomes a theme very early in Scripture. Now, I know that Scripture is a story of God, and Scripture is a story of God and His people, but the way he goes out throughout, especially the book in Genesis, uh, and then beyond that, throughout all of Scripture, family is kind of a core idea going on in Scripture. So if you think of the book of Genesis, uh, you start with Adam and Eve. Uh, and first of all, Adam's alone, and then God says it's not good for him to be alone. And so he creates Eve, and then Adam and Eve are husband and wife, and they have family. Uh, and very quickly, we find out, they are a, a term we like to use nowadays, a dysfunctional family. Uh, they have a sin problem going on there in the garden. They get outside of the garden, and their kids don't get along, and there are all these things going on that are drama within the family. Uh, and then we have Noah and his family, and if you thought uh, Adam and, his, and Eve were something, then, then look at what Noah and his family are like. And at first, we learn that he's righteous, and he builds this ark, and he does all these things that God commands, and at the same time, it doesn't take us very long to recognize that there are some problems in Noah's family, too. Then we see Abraham and Sarah. Uh, and there are times where things are going well for them. There are times where their lack of faith causes them to laugh at the promises of God. There are times where their lack of trust in God causes Abraham to lie about who Sarah is because he fears people around him. And then there are other times where he is this great patriarch of faith. Uh, you think about Isaac and Rebekah uh, and all of the things that go on within their family. And then you think of Jacob and his family and the issues of favoritism. But early on, family is a big core theme within Scripture. And so it's important for us not just to see uh, each thing that happens in each story and what the moral and ethic is we can take out of that, but maybe just the format of how all of this works is important too, as God chooses family to be a method in which he gets his message out, in which he communicates with his people, and the way he will have his people to follow him. So many of God's laws also deal with family. Uh, if you think back to the Ten Commandments, three of the Ten Commandments have some sort of a family element to them. Uh, there are 10, uh, and we learn somewhere along the way that four of those have to do with how we deal with God, and six of those have to do with how we deal with each other. And of those six dealing with one another's, 
Three of those are family things. Uh, first of all, honor your father and mother. Uh, we know that one well. Uh, some of you kids have probably had to memorize that somewhere along the way and try to remember that. So parents and children is an important part of family. And then we have don't commit adultery. And so having a commitment within the marital relationship is part of those four commandments. And then one that's got a family element you may not think of as a family thing quite as much. Uh, all the way down toward the end, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's. So don't covet your neighbor's wife. So now we see family is important to God in the sense that most of the story of God has somehow revolved around families at this point. He's going to have this promise that comes through the family of Abraham. And now we see that even as he puts laws out, as he makes 10 rules, three of them are going to deal with family. And then further on down, when we get into Deuteronomy, quite a bit in chapter 21 and 25 also deal with family. So you have all these laws about uh, everything from how to clean mildew out of your house to how to sacrifice and everything in between. But somewhere in the midst of all of that are an awful lot of rules about family. Uh, and I've uh, been to some of your homes back when we were allowed to do those kinds of things. And I've seen on some of your walls, you might have something that's like family rules. You probably bought at Hobby Lobby and it's decorative. But uh, there's something on there about what your family does and what your family is about. And for God's people, he wants the families to have some sort of rules that they live by and laws that they live by. God's people were supposed to hand these laws down through family. And so there were times when we look at the Old Testament that people would forget about God's laws. Uh, there was Uzzah and the Ark. Uh, Uzzah is struck down when he touches the ark, and the reason that happens is not because God is unreasonable or not because Uzzah was a thrill seeker that day. It's because God's people forgot they're supposed to carry the ark in a certain way, and they weren't doing that. They're supposed to have it on those beams, and the Levites are supposed to carry it along, and instead, they've got it on this cart. And somewhere along the way, they find out we've forgotten about this. Later on down in exile, they've forgotten the laws to the point that when Ezra comes out by the gate of the city, they all gather around just to listen to the law being read. <laughs> what would you do if I showed up here tonight and I told you, we have a special Sunday night for you. We're going to read about 12 chapters of Leviticus together. Uh, everybody would probably have a little less of a skip in their step just because it seems kind of monotonous. And yet all these people gather around Ezra and they want to hear the words of the law. And the reason they have forgotten is because they've forgotten this. How were they supposed to have learned that in the first place? That they weren't supposed to get sent off to Sunday school to learn that, although it's fine to learn those things, and we're glad we have teachers. Uh, they weren't supposed to uh, somehow find a, a video series on uh, Abraham Tube or whatever, uh, where they would learn those things. Instead, it's parents teaching to kids, who teach to their kids, who teach to their kids, and on and on and on it goes. And it's described this way in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life and your days will be long. You were supposed to tell this to your son and to your son's son and your son's son, and I, I know the daughters are all a part of this too. This keeps getting passed on generation after generation after generation. And by the way, this, I think, reinforces why family matters to God. Why when we look throughout the book of Genesis, you have all these families that are part of the story. is because this was always part of God's plan as to how his story would continue to go on. Especially in a day and time where not everybody had multiple copies of the Bible, didn't have it on their phones, all of those things. The way they would learn the statutes of God was from mom and dad and from grandma and grandpa. And gradually they would learn those things and they would become in their hearts and then they could pass them on to their own families. In these words, uh, later in chapter 6, I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And I like the description here of the win because the win is not, it's not even like the feast that would come later. That there are all these feasts they will have to keep and there are specific times of year when they will happen. Uh, it's, it's not like special days. It's not like there is an occasion of, we will go learn about God at, at affirming the faith when that comes around next year back at MacArthur uh, up in the city. We, we will learn about God. Uh, I'll go to the Harding Lectures in the fall, and I'll learn about God there. We'll learn about God on Sundays. This is daily stuff. This is their daily routine. And I don't know what your daily routine is like. Some of you may have a list that you work with. And some of you may just wake up and kind of it, it comes as it comes. 
but for them, daily life, part of what was supposed to be involved in that is this talk about God. And if that is not part of our daily walk, maybe that's the, the one challenge we can take out of this. I, I don't hate to give you the challenge this early in the sermon, but maybe this is the one thing we can take away, that if talk about God, if training about God, if concentration on things of God are not part of just regular daily routine for us, maybe this is the place where we can begin to change. And as we do that, our families become more centered around God because it's more about who we are. Family is not, also, uh, not only a genetic bond. As I tried to mention to you early on, if you look around and you think, well, I don't have a lot of family here, maybe this doesn't apply to me, there's a lot more to family than just blood relatives. Uh, and we see that in a biblical example in the book of Ruth. Um, Naomi comes along and uh, there's all this death around and everyone's kind of splitting and going their way, but, but not Ruth. She's not going to do that. Uh, it says that Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. This is not just a, uh, the verse we read at weddings. This was actually something that happened in this family. That there was an excuse to leave and separate. And instead, it was viewed as a reason to be together. Because there was a need for one another there. And the first part of the book of Proverbs is a father teaching his son. Uh, it says in verses 8 and 9 of Proverbs 1, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. And all of the wisdom that will come throughout, it goes in several phases, but a pretty good chunk of that first nine chapters is just this idea of a father teaching his son. What, what do you need to know about life? What is important for you to know about God? And let me teach you these truths. And sharing the gospel also begins with family. Uh, we find in Acts 18 that the family of Crispus is converted. Uh, we find in 1 Corinthians 1 that the, the family of Stephanus is converted. And then in a really familiar story for us, the Philippian jailer. We like to point to that one in Churches of Christ because there's baptism in there. And we find in Acts 16 that he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Uh, the jailer assumes that his prisoners have escaped. They have not. And he is so happy that they're still there. He learns more about who they are. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Because when you find out about Jesus, when you find out about what would free these prisoners and yet leave them here out of concern for, for me and my family, then the, once you've been affected by that, the first people you want to tell are your family. Something's really important in life, something that will change their lives. Who do you begin with? Family. And who do you sometimes struggle with because they don't respond to it the way you do? Family. And here in the case of the Philippian jailer, we have a good result, not always that way. Uh, we are to love, honor, and care for family. Uh, I steal some of Butch's thunder from a couple months down the road probably. Uh, but in Ephesians 5, you've got wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. In uh, verses 25 and 26, there's actually another part after that, guys. Uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. And then in chapter 6, almost an echoing of what we hear about honoring father and mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So there is honor and love and submission and all of these things going on within family. God keeps coming back to family over and over again throughout Scripture. And so let's not overlook, as we see all the things that he teaches about it, what we can bring uh, into our own families. And then in 1 Timothy 5, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So there's also an expectation beyond just love and submission and respect of all of those things that there's going to be a caring for to some degree. And again, this is one of those places where families oftentimes will hurt us because they don't respect this in the same way that you do, or maybe sometimes you don't respect it in the same way that they do. And yet there is this call to us to take care of one another, to love one another, to watch out for each other. So good families share six qualities in common. Uh, I forgot to put the name of the book on here, but there is a book called Fantastic Families that is by a, a couple of couples who are also counselors. And they talk about how they did a lot of research uh, a few decades ago now, but it still holds pretty true, I think. And the research they found was, as they found families that seemed to be doing well, there were these six common threads that kept coming back. And, and they were uh, not remotely shocked to find out that all of these were teachings of Scripture. All of these were things that God 
wants us to be. So as we think about how we can be better families, let's think about these things. First of all, commitment. Okay, being a family begins with commitment. And this is something, by the way, that is very counter to our culture nowadays, isn't it? Uh, family is one of those things that is easily jumped into and out of in the American culture now. And yet we know as the people of God, that's not at all how he designed it. The intent was always for family to be something that kept going and kept going that we were committed to. <coughs> Excuse me. In Malachi chapter 2, uh, we read this. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he, is, he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one, God's, uh, what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Now, Malachi is talking a little deeper than just a marriage here. He's talking about Israel and God uh, and Israel's tendency to kind of go off their own way and God to keep trying to draw them back in, but still being frustrated with them throughout that process. But we can also learn from this about the importance of commitment to God. And that begins with the marriage, obviously, but also continues past that to the rest of the family. Uh, to parents and children, to grandparents and grandchildren, that we are all committed to each other, wanting the best for each other. Uh, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's putting the words uh, of Paul in Philippians 2 into action. The idea that we're supposed to consider others above ourselves, not to worry so much about what we want, but to worry more about what others want. And for most of us, e even if we try to do this, even if we feel that we're good at this at sometimes, there are still times where it is hard to let go of what we want, isn't it? Uh, it's hard sometimes within marriage, it's hard sometimes just within family to really want something a certain way and to be willing to set that aside for just a moment and really truly hear the other person and, and understand what it is that they want and what it is that they need and to realize that sometimes the things that they want and need are reasonable and sometimes much better than what I had in mind in the first place. And so here we see that God is very concerned about our commitment with each other. Uh, and they list several in, that, in the book that I really like. Uh, one, a commitment to marriage. Uh, two, a commitment to family members. Three, a commitment to priorities. Uh, are we all going to be on the same page about what is important and what is not important? When I've done premarital counseling in the past, uh, it's amazing to me how many of the things that are clearly going to be a struggle in married life come back to this one. What, what do we think is important when it comes to how money is spent. Uh, what do we think is important when it comes to uh, where we go when we travel? What do we think is important uh, when it comes to uh, how, how big our family should be? Uh, what church is like? Are we together on that? Uh, what do we think is important with all these things of life? And for us as families, it's important for us to have priorities that are similar. And if our priorities coming in are not similar, we can't just pretend that's not there. We have to kind of work our way through that to something closer. A commitment to honesty. We are not going to lie to each other. Uh, we are not going to be dishonest with each other. We are going to try to be as upfront as we can possibly be. So there aren't uh, bad surprises. There aren't hurt feelings because of misunderstandings. We are going to be upfront and honest. And again, we struggle with that sometimes, don't we? we we've been trained by culture that little lies don't impact anybody, don't matter. And we know all too well when we've been lied to that that's not the case. Uh, a commitment to family tradition. Your family probably has some traditions. Uh, mine probably has some. You probably think mine are crazy, and I probably think yours are crazy. And yet to us, they are important. And this shouldn't shock us either because God is a God of this kind of thing all throughout Scripture. He sets up ways for people to remember. And within our families, it's the same thing. Uh, our family every year, we do the same thing. Uh, we pull the Christmas stuff out of the attic. Uh, we put it all... Nathan pulls the Christmas stuff out of the attic, I watch. Uh, he hands it down to me, and then I bring it inside. Uh, we put it all on the living room floor. Uh, Stacy gets the ornaments out because no one else wants to touch them and do anything wrong. Uh, and then she starts handing the ornaments to us, and we place them on the tree. Uh, I can't think of the last time I watched my wife put an ornament on the tree or anyone else take an ornament out of the box. Why? I have no idea. But we do it that way, and we do it that way every time. And we all groan when it starts, except for Stacy, who's always excited about it for some reason. Uh, we all groan when it starts, but by the end, we're all happy we did it. We had this time together. It was all good. 
uh, it's good for us to have traditions like that, uh, and not just holiday time, but uh, all the time. And then a commitment to longevity. Uh, and maybe that sounds like just commitment in general, but we're in this for the long haul. We don't give up on each other. We don't walk away. We just keep going and doing right. Now, again, because not all of us are in the same spot in life, I would imagine some here probably have felt betrayed somewhere along the way in this, or maybe some here have felt like you really let somebody down along the way in this. And I would ask you to try to reconcile the ways that you can reconcile there and to forgive in the ways that you can forgive there and in the places that just need to be moved on from because you have held on to that for so long to do that. Uh, it is a struggle for us all to figure out where we fit in this, but know that God values commitment uh, to him and to each other. Secondly, express appreciation and affection. Now, I want you to notice here because I was very tempted to shorten because I wanted it to fit on one, one line because it looks better. I almost put appreciation and affection, but that's not the key here. The key here is the expressing, because I think most of us probably have some level of appreciation and affection for each other, definitely within our family, and probably even as it extends out from our family. There are people here within the room that you are not a blood relative of, that you appreciate a lot, and maybe you just don't say that a lot. The key here is for us to express that appreciation. I've heard an old preacher story that was kind of a, a joking thing of uh, an older guy whose wife said to him, you never say I love you anymore. And he said, well, I, remember when we got married? And she said, yes, I do. And she, he said, I, I said it that day, and I have not changed my mind. How well is that going to work out for you? We have to express this to each other. And, and I want you to think for a moment about this story of the lepers. And we're all familiar with it. When we were kids, we sang a song about it. There are all these lepers who were healed, 10 lepers, and it says one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praised God with a loud voice, and he fell at on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Do you think all 10 lepers were thankful? We, we don't usually think about this side of the story very often. We kind of harp on these nine ungrateful people and the one who is especially thankful and says something. I would almost guarantee you that all 10 were thankful. All 10 of them, the other nine who said nothing, all of their lives were changed in an instant. They were healthy. They were ceremonially, ceremonially clean. They could go back to the temple. They could be a part of their synagogue. They could be a part of family, community, everything again. Could you imagine what it would be like to be isolated for that long and then suddenly all of the, Maybe you can. We've kind of been there, haven't we? What it's like to be isolated like that and the thankfulness that comes with being welcomed in again there is no way you would not be thankful at some level for that. But nine of them didn't say anything. How easy is it for us as people to live lives where we feel very, very thankful, but we don't express it? And for these good families, these families that are doing well, one of the keys, one of those six keys is they are willing to express that. And I will tell you, by the way, if in your mind you are thinking, okay, I should do that in this way and I should do that this often, Whatever you're thinking right now, multiply it by about 10 because it will take more than you can imagine. And especially if you are a cynical or negative person by nature, you've got to just overwhelm with the good and overwhelm with the thankfulness. So we learn from these lepers, it's one thing to be thankful, it's a totally different thing to actually express that out loud to someone. And, and by the way, sorry to bring up the love languages, uh, by the way, in a way that they actually appreciate, not in the way that you think is great, but in a way that you've begun to understand these other people within your family and you know how they hear that, you have to say it in that way. Number three, share positive communication, kind of along the same lines but slightly different. We have a tendency to talk about the negative things that come up, don't we? Uh, I told my wife this morning, and I, I've still forgotten to tell her about what happened. Uh, I said, remind me to tell you about the dream I had last night. And generally, if I have a positive or a neutral dream, I just get kind of one ear out the other, and I don't want really to think much of it. If I have a crazy negative dream, I've got to tell you about that. It's just weird. Uh, I was having dental work done at a dental work slash tattoo parlor slash uh, dispensary slash something else. I can't remember what the other thing was. I was sitting on a cot having a crown put on. Uh, and people on the phone were talking about all kinds of crazy things, and I, and I woke up from that in a cold sweat, and I thought, this is, this is crazy. 
Are, are we going to share positive things or just weird things and negative things? It's so easy for us to complain about things. What if with the people we care about, we made a real effort not just to be thankful, but also to be positive? Because when you have been around negativity a lot, you know what that is like. And when you have been around negative people a lot, and you have the choice, you have the option. Both people have called you and invited you to come and do something. And one of them is incredibly cynical and negative, and the other one is just a joy to be around. Who do you want to go be with? And the answer is obvious. For us as families, we should be providing that to one another. And again, this is one of those places I'm waiting for the lightning to come down because I'm, I'm not as good at this as I need to be. And yet I understand that we are called to be people who are positive. And throughout the book of Proverbs, we see several examples and encouragements along this line. In chapter 15 of verse 4, it says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but per <coughs> perverseness is in it breaks the spirit. In chapter 16, verse 24, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. And in chapter 18, verse 4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. All these great things that come with just good words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. About the most untrue thing you were ever told somewhere along the way. Words hurt, but words also have the potential to help and to build and to encourage. And those people that we should be encouraging the most are those people who are our family. Those people who are in our homes those people who are connected to us in one way or another, we can begin our encouragement there. Number four, time together. There is no substitute for this. And our world would tell you this is not the important thing. Our world has convinced us that you just got to work harder and longer so you can give your family the things that they need. And generally speaking, what your family needs is you. It's easy for us to excuse it, it's easy for us to buy in, but time together is key. And for those of us who do not have a lot of time together uh, because of work schedules or, or all kinds of different things, then we just have to be a lot more intentional about this. It, it can't be something that we just assume is going to happen, uh, and then it never does. Uh, for a lot of us, we have these crazy things in our house called tables with chairs around them, and they are decorative for many. Uh, we had a dining room table with six chairs at it in the house I grew up in, and a kitchen table with four chairs at it. I probably ate a meal at either of those places 20 times in the entire time growing up. All the rest of the time, TV trays on the couch in front of the TV. Wheel of Fortune. That was for family time. Now, I, I don't know the value of Wheel of Fortune and family time. Uh, they're great puzzles and all that stuff. But I think we missed something there at the table. Uh, so if you have a table and you don't use that, let me encourage you. That's a good place to start. But we can find ways to spend time together. Uh, the wise man in Ecclesiastes uh, talks all about these things that there are times for. Uh, everything, uh, for everything there's a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace, and I believe a time for our families if we are not making that time already. And so if you are not, maybe this is the place where you can look at today and say, okay, we talk all the time about needing family time. How can we actually make that happen? And I will tell you that those people that you know who have a lot of family time, it seems like their family is always doing something together. It seems like their family is always eating meals together or they talk about their family Devo or whatever it is that they're doing. They have the same amount of hours in the day as you do. They were likely just as annoyed of losing an hour of sleep last night as you were, but they will continue on doing those things. And if they can, so can you and so can I. Number five, uh, nurture, nurture spiritual well-being. In Acts chapter 2, we find this description of the church. I'm not going to read all the way through it. But what the church does in Acts 2 that causes that growth is they are doing life together. They are concerned about each other. They want to make sure everyone is being taken care of. They are spending time together. They're spending time in the Word. They're spending time in prayer. They're encouraging. 
they are, as a church family, what we need to be both as a church family and within our own families. We need to show this level of love and concern for each other and to be concerned about our spiritual well-being. How are we doing in our relationships with God? How are we doing in our time with God? And these are all things that we need to think about. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. These are the words of Paul in Philippians 4 and verse 8. And then number six, learn to cope with stress and crisis. So much of our struggle within families are when things get incredibly difficult, it's hard to remember the other five. When things get incredibly difficult, it's hard not to let all of those feelings of frustration and hurt and pain come out. And generally, the people that you will hit with those the most are the people around you, the people that are closest to you. Because you feel like you go to work and you have to still be who you are at work. And you go to church and you're supposed to be who you are at church. But my family, I can let my guard down. And so often that letting the guard down ends up just creating tension and problems. And instead, we need to learn how to cope with these things. And that, of course, begins with Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So how do we cope with all of that? We take it to Jesus. And as family members, how do we help, help one another cope with all of that? We encourage each other to take those things to Jesus. Not to let them fester within us, not to let that anger take hold, but instead to realize that we serve a God who cares enough about us that he wants to take these things from us. So these qualities, again, commitment, appreciation and affection, positive communication, time together, spiritual well-being, and coping with stress and crisis. Now, you may look at this list and think to yourself, okay, we're, we're good at most of these, uh, or maybe most look at this list and think we're, we're struggling with a lot of those. It may seem overwhelming. And it's our nature, I think, at times to look at something like this and think, okay, that all sounds good. That all sounds like something out of a book about families. And I would love to be able to do that. But let's be real, Brian. That's a lot of stuff that I'd have to change in life. Where, where would I even get started with that? And I would encourage you to begin with, don't look at this and think I'm going to do all of this at once because that probably is not going to work for most of us. Uh, instead, let's look at it this way. Uh, here's some practical steps. First of all, Assess your family's strengths. Now, chances are, when you look at those six things, as great or as struggling as you feel like your family is, you are probably good at least at, at a couple of those things, or, or maybe one of those things. And the fact that you are is something to be celebrated. And, and I'll let you in on a little secret. The one that you are really good at may be the one that a family you look at as having it all together is really struggling with. And so you have figured something out that they have not yet figured out, and vice versa. So look, first of all, and realize there are places here that we can grow from this foundation. Secondly, have a dream session. This sounds a little hokey. I understand it almost sounds like a, a group therapy kind of thing, but hang with me for a second. Don't just let all of this roll in your own head and think to yourself, man, I wish my family would get on board with this, and none of your family has any idea about it in the first place. You have to sit down and talk about some of these things. One of those uh, tables with the chairs, you can sit down around that thing and talk about hey, here's some things I think that would make our family better. And what do you think about this? And you may also find out that they see it differently than you do. And they feel like this thing that you feel is lacking is actually pretty good from their angle. And maybe you can learn some things in that way. Uh, third, choose specific goals. You will find out, generally speaking, in life that if your goal is vague, your results are probably not going to be that great. But if your goal is pretty specific, you have a much better chance of getting to what it is. Uh, and secondly, within that, if your specific goal is reasonable, you have a good chance at getting at what it is. So don't try to jump from this one area on that list of six is the thing we're absolutely worst at and not even close to, and we'd like to have that perfect in the next four weeks. It just doesn't work that way. But have specific goals that you can do. Four, make a plan. So if we want to spend more family time together, maybe next week you don't begin by we're going to meet, eat together for dinner at the table every night. But what if you started doing it on Tuesday and Thursday? Or what if you started doing it on Wednesday before you come to church? Or sometime along the way you figure out, okay, this is a specific thing we can do. 
Uh, what if now there's not a whole lot of anything that looks Bible-like going on at home? Everybody kind of does their own thing. What if you got together and instead of having a long extended thing, you each day read a verse together as a family and somebody said a prayer? Uh, it's a small thing, but it would begin to move in a good direction. Fifth, use outside resources. Uh, don't assume this one thing I'm drawing from, this one sermon is the answer to everything. You may find something that is a better fit for you and don't be afraid to seek that out. Uh, or to seek out help from people that you view and you think, man, it seems like, it seems like their family is a little more like what I wish our family could be like. What, what, what are they doing that's different? And talk to them about that. Uh, and then number six, <clears throat> commit. We started with commitment, we end with commitment. You're committed to your family and you're also committed to the process of we are going to do this and we're going to do this better. And this is important enough to us that we want to get this going. As we wrap all this together, a couple things. One, it would be very easy for you now to sit back and say, this would have been handy to have thought about when my kids were small. Uh, this would have been handy to have thought about uh, right after we got back from the honeymoon and we're all excited about married life and all of that, uh, and we could have sat down some of these things and started. Uh, I will tell you, like everything else in life, you can do that, and you can look at it and say, this is something I should have done 20 years ago. Or you can look at it and say, I've still got some time left here on this planet. I've still got some time left here with these people. And what am I going to do with that? Whether I feel like it's five years or 25 years or 50 years or 100 years, what am I going to do with that time? And am I going to tra try to make my family more of what God wants my family to be? Because God would not talk about family as much as he does if it did not matter to him. So does family matter to you today? I, I hope it does. Uh, and we're going to talk about family a little bit more throughout this month. Uh, as we get into our Sunday nights, let me just let you in on our, our idea of how this will go for a little while. Uh, each month we will have a theme kind of like this. Uh, we'll talk about family this month. Uh, there will be a month we talk about evangelism. There will be a month we talk about prayer and about thankfulness. And we will uh, do that in some different ways. We will uh, have Mostly me up here like we usually do. Uh, Thorin will be up here a little bit more than he's been. Thank goodness, I like hearing Thorin. Uh, and from time to time, we might do something of a, a different format where maybe a couple of us get up and, and have a conversation and you're listening in on it or something like that. Uh, but we're going to look at these things from all kinds of different angles because they're all important themes throughout Scripture and family being the one in which we begin. I, I think we saw that last week in our young people being up here and, and they were leading us in worship time how important kids are to us. Uh, and next time we'll look a little bit more at how important marriage is to us and how we should value that and the things we should do. But for your family, let me encourage you, if not this, something. If not this, something that makes your family a little more of what God wants it to be. And if your family is doing incredibly well in these things or you feel like your family is just a great example of what God wants a family to be, then let me encourage you to help other people. Uh, and help them to be able to see that as well. We have a lot of great examples of good families here that you can learn from and, and that I can learn from too. Tonight, if your family's not what, what you want it to be, it's not really like a come forward and confess it kind of thing, but maybe you can have a conversation in the car on the way home. Uh, or if your family is a, at a distance from here, maybe you can pick up the phone and call and have that conversation. Uh, if you are not a part of God's family, he would love for you to be a part of his family, to be baptized into him, and to change your life tonight. Or if you have been a part of the family and just not been the part you'd like to be, come back to him in the way that you need to tonight as we stand and sing.